Thank you, Stephen, choir and orchestra. It is so good to be with you today. I say that every time I see you, and I mean it. I want to thank you for being here today. We've already acknowledged that this Memorial Day weekend always carries with it its own amount of grief and sorrow as we remember those who have fallen. But this particular Sunday and this week, all of us have come here carrying our own grief. This I know full well. And Jesus does too. So I want you to know that you are wanted and you are welcome in this place just as you are. Whatever you're carrying. You're wanted with us. You're welcome before us. But you're certainly wanted and welcome before Jesus. He knows what it's like to grieve. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, his word says. And if I know it to be true, it's because this story that I have the joy of sharing with you today from God's word from Matthew chapter 14. You can go ahead and turn there if you'd like, Matthew 14. I encourage you to because we'll really be rooted in that passage all morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. If not, you can use this QR code on the back of your bulletin for the sermon response guide. The text for today is there as well as room for you to take notes here. But I encourage you to have your Bibles open with me this morning. But in Matthew 14, there's this story that's so well known. It's known as one of Jesus' greatest miracles when Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is actually the only miracle of Jesus that is recorded in all four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But as I was preparing for this day with you, even before all the events unfolded this week, I was struck by something that I got to be honest, I never really noticed before. That we're going to jump in at Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. And Jesus, in verse 13, he's grieving. It's important to know that this story starts from a position of grief. Jesus is grieving, and one of the greatest miracles that he's about to do comes from that place. I pray that encourages you today. So let's jump in and see Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. Jesus says, or not Jesus, sorry. Matthew says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. I'll stop there because that's an interesting way to begin our story for today. Saying, now when Jesus heard this, as readers, we can't help but wonder, well, what did Jesus hear? If you look at the beginning of Matthew 14, you see that King Herod had hosted a banquet at which John the Baptist is beheaded. And John the Baptist's disciples have come to tell Jesus the news of John the Baptist's gruesome death. John the Baptist, Jesus has just referred earlier in the book of Matthew to as one of the greatest prophets, the greatest before Jesus. John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. And we see in this story that John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus in more ways than one. As his death foreshadows Jesus'. You've got to know that Jesus knew what was coming. When I see Jesus going off by himself to grieve, I can't help but see him in the Garden of Gethsemane, too. Grieving, crying out to God in honest communication. John the Baptist was also a friend of Jesus, and more than that, he was family. As John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth, who was related to Jesus' mother, Mary. Sure enough, they were close. So it says, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. So when I think of Jesus receiving this news of someone close to him, a family member passing, I can't help but think of my own story and my very first encounter with death close to me. I was 13 years old. It was one night in February and I remember I was standing before my bathroom mirror trying to figure out how I was going to do my hair for the upcoming Valentine's dance at my middle school. All of a sudden I heard this blood curdling scream and I left my room and I go out to the landing that overlooks the family room at my parents' house and I see my mom on the ground beating against the floor, crying out in anguish like I'd never heard before. Now I was 13, death hadn't come to knock at our door just yet, 
And so I was trying to figure out why she would be so, so broken. And I thought, well, I remember she has this mirror that belonged to her grandma. Maybe somebody broke her grandma's mirror. That sounds kind of silly now. But I come downstairs and mom and dad look at me and they tell me that just a couple hours earlier, my cousin Tiffany, who's 17, was driving home. And she was in a car accident. And it killed her. She's home with Jesus now. But when I heard that news, what did I do? I went right back up the stairs, went to my room, closed the door behind me, sat down on the ground, back leaned up against the door. Everything was foggy. I remember thinking I was in a book, but this couldn't actually be happening. Why do I share that with you? Because when I heard the news that my cousin had died, all I wanted to do was go away and be by myself for a little while. And I'm encouraged to see that Jesus does the very same thing here as we start our story today. This morning, I hope that we will remember who Jesus is. He's fully God. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. He'll show you. He is God. But Jesus is also fully human. Jesus shows us the fullness of who we were created to be in him. So I'm encouraged that Jesus shows us here that it's okay to grieve. And it's okay to need room to breathe when we do. But I promise I'll read more for us today. But know that you're wanted and welcome before God, just as you are. Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him, and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. An incredible story. One of Jesus' greatest miracles coming out from this place of grief. But what I'm struck by as we continue, so Jesus goes off by himself to grieve, but when the crowds hear this, they go to be with Jesus. They follow him on foot from several towns because they believe that Jesus will heal them. They believe that Jesus will help him, them. And so I'm struck before Jesus has compassion on the crowds and heals them. Our scripture says in verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. That in his grief, foggy as it may be, he could still see a crowd in need. So he sees that crowd. In his own grief, he has compassion on them and he heals them. How? Because he's God. And I want to encourage you today that the same spirit that's about to raise Jesus from the dead lives in us today too. Do you believe it? Do you receive it? All of us who trust in Jesus. Now it says it gets late. And the disciples, goodness, we got to love them. They represent us, don't you know? We too are disciples. They do a kind thing, right? They're out here, it's getting late in the middle of nowhere. People got to be hungry. Jesus, shouldn't we send them into town so they can buy dinner for themselves? Seems like a good plan, but it's not the way of Jesus. He has something better in mind. 
So Jesus says, they need not go away. Verse 16. I said this story is in all four gospel accounts, but Matthew is the only gospel that includes this line from Jesus that I believe is very important to what Matthew is wanting to teach us. Jesus says, they need not go away. Why? Because the crowds had come to be with Jesus. More important than their healing was the healer. More important than bread for dinner was the bread of life. Jesus wants them to remain with him. And he wants that for his disciples too. And friends, he wants that for us too today. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Can you imagine? Surrounded by thousands of people in the middle of nowhere. And Jesus saying to us, you give them something to eat. You feed them. Goodness, we don't have pockets big enough for that. Even Mary Poppins' bag wasn't quite big enough for that, I don't think. But Jesus says, you feed them. You give them something to eat. So naturally, they look down and they say, Lord, we, we only have five loaves and two fish. I love how the NRSV puts it. It says, they say, we have nothing here but. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I know it does for me. God, I've got nothing but. I've got only. Why is that so often the first thing that we see? Our nothing but or our only, that's not what Jesus sees. And you know, Jesus could have told them, well, actually, what you do have is, but he doesn't. Verse 18, I hope you'll mark it in your Bible. It is key to understanding the entire meaning of this passage that I'm sharing with you today, but it is also a primary call of Jesus on our lives. What does he say? Lord, we have only. We've got nothing but. Jesus says, bring them here to me. Do you hear him? Bring them here to me. Not unlike his call for us to come and follow him. Not unlike the call that Travis shared with us last weekend. As Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Come and follow me. Bring it here to me. Give it to me. Cast your cares upon him. He cares for you and me. Bring them here to me. I find it ironic that the last time I had the joy of preaching God's word with you was in this very room in Matthew 26 as Mary of Bethany anoints Jesus. With a jar of oil, she pours on him over a year's worth of wages, this extravagant act of worship. And Jesus says, she's done a beautiful thing to me. So we see that Jesus wants our extravagance. And here we see Jesus also wants our scarcity. Jesus wants it all. I'll also say Jesus wants our sin. As we were singing before, maybe you feel like you can't even come to Jesus because you're just so stuck in this pattern of sin as it never seems to lose its appeal, but it doesn't make good on its promises. Jesus wants that too. Your extravagance, your scarcity, your sin, your grief, your sorrow, your sadness, your only, your nothing, but he wants it all because he wants to be our all in all. He's so much better. He's the bread of life. bring them here to me. It really doesn't make sense if you think about this situation logically because Jesus just told the disciples, you feed them, you give them something to eat. So they look at what they have and you think they'd go ahead and start giving it to the crowds, right? Obeying Jesus and just see what happens, see how far it goes. But again, that's not the way of Jesus. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And then he says, when they look at their only, their nothing but, bring them here to me. Don't go trying to meet the needs around you without coming to me first. I'm your greatest need, and I'll supply all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Bring it here to me. And I love this. Verse 19, after he orders the crowds to sit on the grass. He takes their five loaves and two fish and he practices what he preaches. Jesus is the best teacher. Jesus takes those five loaves and two fish and he lifts them up to heaven. He lifts them up to God his Father in an offering. 
He brings them to God the Father. Jesus never asks us to do something he's not willing to do himself. As he says, bring it here to me. And he brings what we bring to God the Father in prayer. Always interceding for us. And then, after this, especially after this, offering what we have to God the Father, Jesus then gives back to the disciples to give to the crowds. And there's leftovers still. Don't you see, Jesus could have just given the food to the crowds himself, couldn't he? But again, do you hear me this morning? Do you hear him? That's not his way. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus wanted to give to the disciples that they would give to the crowds. And there's leftovers still. If there's something we can learn from this passage today, it's this. Jesus feeds us. Jesus feeds us, but he doesn't stop there, does he? Jesus feeds us to feed others. And he doesn't stop there either. Jesus feeds us to feed others, and there is leftover still. Don't you think, when the disciples look down at their only and their nothing but, and Jesus says, bring it to me to feed those around him, wouldn't they have been a little bit nervous, a little bit concerned at their scarcity? Lord Jesus, if I bring this to you and, and share with these thousands of people around me, will there be anything left for me? Will I go hungry? This five loaves and two fish that probably wasn't much for 12 hungry disciples. Sure enough, thousands. I love that it says that they take 12 baskets full of leftovers. These broken pieces of bread. I gotta imagine those 12 disciples all walking home with their baskets full of bread left over in awe that they are leaving with more than what they came with, only in the hands of God. I do this. Do you? that these things that feel so mounting and pressing against me, more often than not, I feel like I don't have enough. I've got nothing but, I've got only. And my tendency is to take my nothing but and my only and put it straight to the task at hand or the people behind it, bypassing Jesus in the process. That's not his way. He wants me to bring him whatever I have first. So he'll take it to God the Father, give it back to me to give to others, and they'll be left over still. In him, there's always more than enough because he is more than enough. He is the bread of life. John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Whatever we bring to Jesus, our only, our nothing but, our scarcity, our extravagance, our sin, our sadness, our tears this week. Some of you say all you have are tears. That's enough. It's more than enough in the hands of Jesus, the bread of life, the great I am. Because he is. He wants it all. So he would be our all in all. He feeds us to feed others, and there's leftovers still. So I present to you this morning my conviction that even in our grief, we can still feed others. Because in our grief, Jesus still feeds us. Do you hear it? Even in our grief, we can still feed others because even in our grief, Jesus still feeds us. He's with us. In the kingdom of God, we shine in our suffering. Have you noticed that? Only Jesus. Because in our suffering, Jesus still shines on us. Jesus still shines in us and through us. And I know this is true for so many of you, but as I've been praying and preparing this word for you today, God continued to put three women from Park Cities on my heart who have been feeding me in their grief and their suffering without even knowing it. Simply being God's daughters, letting him love them, loving him right back, pouring out praise when there seems to be no reason for praise because they're so in love with our maker, our savior, 
the bread of life. These three women are Carrie Green, Micah Peterson, and Valerie Bergstrom. I'll share about Valerie for a moment because she let me. Pending that God gets the glory, he will. Maybe you were here with me in this room on Easter Sunday as I saw Valerie right up here in the choir loft singing praises to Jesus, our risen Savior, beaming. Valerie works with us. If you don't know her, she's here today in the choir. I've known her. She shines brighter now than I've ever seen her shine before. That's Jesus. She's singing praises here, beaming, and she's feeding me in her grief because you may not know that not long before that she had lost her brother and her mother within days of each other. And still, deep in grief, sings to our resurrected King Jesus. I called her this week to ask permission to mention her today and she told me that I'm feeding her as she's been feeding me. Isn't it funny how that's how it works in God's kingdom? We feed one another encouragement. And she told me that as we hosted a, a memorial service for her brother and her mother, she was writing a tribute that she really wanted to share at that service to honor them. It was very important. She said she was just weeping as she wrote that tribute. She cried out to God, how am I supposed to do this? I have nothing. And she told me that she was able to go to that memorial in our chapel, stand up and offer that tribute. And she said she felt like she was floating on the prayers of God's people. To which I said, Valerie, so much more than that. You were floating on the prayers of Christ Jesus himself who always intercedes for us. She said that was her own miracle. This miracle of the feeding of 5,000. Do you hear it? She brought what she had to Jesus. What felt like nothing. Just a whole lot of grief and sorrow and suffering and tears and questions. But she brought it to him. He gave it to God the Father, gave it back to her, and it was enough to feed her, to feed others, and there's leftover still. I see it in my sister shining in her suffering. And that's true for every one of us in the kingdom of God. We can shine in our suffering because Jesus shines on us. He shines in us and through us. We can feed others in our grief because Jesus feeds us. We may not be surrounded by 5,000 people starving for food in our present context, but we sure are surrounded by 5,000 people starving for peace, purpose, and the presence of Jesus Christ. And surely, we can feed them. And we can feed one another. Brian, thank you so much for sharing that passage earlier from John 21. I love it. Don't you? I hope you'll come back to it this week. As Jesus walks along the Sea of Galilee, much like he'd done in Matthew chapter 4, as he sees Andrew and Simon Peter on a boat fishing, and he says, come and follow me, and they leave their nets and everything to follow him at once. Now John 21, Jesus is walking along the same sea, and he cries out to his children, are you catching anything? No, nope, nothing. Why don't you toss your net on the other side? They catch so much. But we entered into it, the story today to see that Jesus already had the bread and the fish prepared. Did you notice? But Jesus says, come, bring to me. Do you hear it? Bring me some fish. Bring me what you got. Bring it to me. And Jesus breaks the bread much like he'd done here, much like he does at the Last Supper that should remind us of Good Friday, Jesus' body broken for us, his blood poured out for us. He gives it to the disciples, they have breakfast together, and then he says to Peter three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Because here's the truth, we love because he first loved us. If you love God, it's because he first loved you. And what's the result of that? The fruit of that? The purpose of that? Love others. Feed a sheep. 
as he feeds us. If I've been convicted of anything with the events that have unfolded this week, it's this. I think we've forgotten how to care for one another. I think we've forgotten how to love one another. Perhaps we've forgotten how to go to Jesus first and let him love us and care for us. Come to Jesus. Bring him all you have. You're only, you're nothing but. In his hands, it's more than enough. He'll feed us to feed others and they'll be left over still. I gotta imagine in John 21, Jesus is also reminding Peter of what happens right here in the middle in Matthew 14, his miracle. Listen, the miracle was never about the bread. It was never about the loaves. It was always about Jesus. Do you know? The bread of life. Always and forever more than enough. Because right after this, Jesus sends his disciples out by themselves for the first time. We'll see they're in a boat and you know the story perhaps. The winds are beating across that boat and the waves are rising and it's dark and they're terrified and Jesus comes, walks on the water, showing he's Lord over the chaos. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me to come to you. And Jesus says, what? Come. Peter walks out to him on the water. But when he looks at the waves, he sinks and he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? And he gets back in the boat with him. The winds cease. Jesus feeds his disciples peace in his presence. I gotta imagine Peter's remembering this too in John 21. The original call of Jesus, the storm and miracle in the middle, and now breakfast, and a reminder of his purpose. I pray the same is true for us today. For some of you, you need to hear Jesus calling for the first time to come and follow him. I pray he gives you the courage to say yes. It really is your best yes. Some of us are in the middle of a storm. We feel like we don't have enough. And we need to see Jesus calling after us, coming to us, inviting us to come to him, bring him all we have and believe that he's more than enough for us and for others and there's leftover still. And some of us need to be reminded of our purpose somewhere along the way we've forgotten. We've forgotten Jesus and we've forgotten how to care for those around us. It starts with him. If you hear anything today, hear him say, come to me. All who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you because you are the bread of life, the living water. I thank you for these stories that you have given us in your word to show us who you are as king, as rescue. Lord Jesus, you're with us. You want all of us, all we have, even if it feels like nothing, because you want to be everything for us. So I pray that as we leave today, that we leave knowing that our lives are in your hands, knowing that you will supply our every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I pray we would leave even in the fog of grief with eyes open to be able to see the needs of those around us. And before we rush to meet those needs apart from you, remind us to come to you first, to bring you what we have, believing that you're more than enough. Lord Jesus, you are more than enough. We praise you for it. Help us believe. Amen.